Welcome to America's Drug Forum. I'm Arnold Treback. In 1971, a young doctor, recently graduated from Harvard Medical School, wrote in a best-selling book, Drugs are with us to stay. Fight them and they will grow ever more destructive. Accept them and they can be turned into non-harmful, even beneficial forces. The young doctor author, still young in my eyes, was Andrew Weil, who is with us today. Good to see you, Andy. Hi, Arnold. Uh, at the present time, Dr. Weil is a professor at the University of Arizona College of Medicine, a practicing physician, and still a researcher and an author. At the core of his ideas is the notion that human beings have a natural drive to alter consciousness, and that society fights that drive at its peril. Have I correctly su summarized the core of the idea, Andy? Very good summary. What do you say? How would you expand on that notion? You know, I began my uh, studies of this field through botany. Uh, I was a botany major as an undergraduate at Harvard and had the good fortune to study under a man named Richard Evans Schultes, who was the director of the Harvard Botanical Museum and a longtime explorer of the Amazon basin. And with his inspiration, I began traveling, uh, first in Latin America, uh, especially in Mexico and Colombia, Peru, uh, Ecuador, Bolivia. I lived with and observed Indians who used natural drugs to alter consciousness. Uh, later, I went to Africa, then to Asia. I've been in many cultures of the world. Uh, I've done a lot of reading about cultures of the past. As far as I can determine, every human society has used drugs. Uh, this is not an American phenomenon. It's not something peculiar to the 20th century. It's something you find human beings doing everywhere. I wrote in my first book, The Natural Mind, that the only culture that I know of that may not have had a traditional psychoactive drug are Eskimos, who had the misfortune not to be able to grow plants and had to wait for us to bring them distilled alcohol, which they quickly learned to abuse horribly. So I think this is a basic human pattern. And not only is it something that people do, but but it's an activity that people put a great deal of time, money, and effort into. Uh, that is the cultivation of drug plants, the preparations of drugs for use, uh, the amount of money made off of their sale. These are all very prominent activities in human cultures throughout history and throughout the world today. When you say there's a natural drive, I, I, I know, I've heard you say this, one thing that annoys you is that people say, you have said there's a natural drive to use drugs. Right. And I haven't said that. I've said there's a natural drive to alter consciousness and that drugs are attractive because they're one way of doing that, that they provide the experiences that people are looking for and they don't require work. But actually, the, some of the activities that I wrote about in The Natural Mind have nothing to do with drugs. In fact, uh, one of the observations that I made, which I think is original, is the extent to which young children uh, do things like spin. Uh, in order to induce changes in perception and consciousness. As far as I can tell, spinning occurs spontaneously in all human cultures. I don't think this is something that is socially learned. It seems to be a biological drive. And you can go back even further than that. If you look at uh, newborn infants, a very common behavior as soon as infants can sit up is to sit in this position, close the eyes and rock into what appears to be a blissful state of consciousness. And that uses a method, rhythmic motion, uh, which has been put to use by many cultures. There are many societies in Africa, for example, that induce trances through uh, repetitive dancing in which, the, in which people move rhythmically back and forth, or use rhythmic sound, drum beats, to induce alterations of consciousness. There are so many activities that produce changes of consciousness, things like sex, falling in love, uh, listening to music, making music, dancing, downhill skiing, jumping out of airplanes. You know, there are all sorts of these activities. And that's what the natural mind means. That's what the natural mind means. That is that it is normal and natural to want to vary your conscious experience. This is part of being human. The reason people are fascinated with drugs is that they provide these experiences. They are one doorway into them. But, but you do not view drugs as a, a, the best way of altering consciousness. Well, I think the drugs have advantages and they have disadvantages. And I can summarize these for you very neatly. In a nutshell, the main advantage of drugs as a technique for altering consciousness is that they work. And they work without any investment of energy on the part of the user. Whereas some of these other methods, you know, like meditation, for example, may take years to to produce the results that people want, years of constant practice. The main disadvantage of drugs, in a nutshell, 
is that if you rely on them as your only method of having these experiences, they begin to fail you. That is, with repeated frequent use, the experiences that you're looking for recede, and you are left then with a habit, and all of these substances used repetitively irritate the body in one degree or another and can lead to dependence and to physical or psychological harm. So I think, in, as I say, in a nutshell, this is the plus and minus. Drugs work, they provide the experiences people are looking for, but if you rely on them as your only technique and use them frequently, they begin not to provide the experience you're looking for and leave you with undesirable effects. Several years ago, more than several, maybe uh, eight or nine years ago, I was talking to the top operational drug control official in the Reagan administration. He looked at one of my books in which I had said, I am a disciple <laughs> of Andrew Weil. And he responded that he thought your books were obscene. <laughs> and he was particularly referring to chocolate to morphine. Right. Uh, uh, in which you lay out, uh, uh, you know, a, a guide for young people. Uh, on the other hand, I know that you have a, an army of devote, uh, uh, devout admirers. How do you explain? You were trained in psychiatry at Harvard. <laughs> How do you explain this emotional divide? Well, you see, I think this is, the, this is also uh, a point that I tried to develop in the natural mind. I don't think that drugs are good or bad in themselves. I think that people can put drugs to good or bad uses. Many people today think in black and white terms. Uh, the just say no crowd is very offended by people in writing that do not tell p kids to say no. My books don't tell people to say no. They also don't tell people to say yes. And I think that's intensely frustrating to people who want to think in black and white terms. Now, it would be more comfortable for them if I were telling kids to go ahead and use drugs. Then they'd know how to type me. But the fact that I don't take a clear position, I think, makes me even more upsetting to them. Now, in my travels around the world and in looking at different societies, what I see as a very common pattern is this. Every culture accepts the use of one or a small number of drugs, which it defines as being okay. Sometimes okay to the point of not even recognizing them as drugs. And it not only tolerates them, but actively encourages their use and promotes their use, and often profits from their use. And then all the rest of the drugs are defined as being bad, evil, the users of them degenerate, and efforts are made to rid society of those drugs and their users. But what I find most interesting is there's no agreement from culture to culture as to which are the okay drugs and which are the not okay drugs. If you are a mainstream American, the okay drugs are alcohol, tobacco, various forms of caffeine, and medically prescribed uppers and downers. If you're a Muslim, alcohol is the big bad drug. Uh, in many Muslim societies, coffee is enthusiastically used. In some, uh, the use of cannabis products may be tolerated. Opium may be tolerated. In um, Native American societies in this uh, country, uh, there are organized religious groups that use peyote, a hallucinogenic cactus. That is considered a sacrament. It's sacrilegious to call it a drug. In those church groups, alcohol, again, is the most evil drug. But tobacco is accepted. Tobacco is, in all Native American religion, an important ceremonial drug. Coffee is used and not even thought of as being a drug. Mescaline, the isolated principle of peyote, is a bad drug because this is a product of white man's laboratories you know, and is not sacred. Uh, in India today, there are areas of India where uh, people who are devoted to the god Shiva use cannabis as a sacramental drug. They smoke it and they eat it. It's sold openly by government licensed stores. It is a religious sacrament, not something that's used recreationally. In those groups, alcohol is not used. That's considered to be detrimental to one's enlightenment. Uh, tobacco may be used. Coffee may be used. You find these interesting kinds of contradictions. I spent some time uh, some years ago in Ethiopia, a country which has a Christian majority that drinks alcohol and a Muslim minority that chews a leaf called kat, which is the closest thing nature produces to amphetamines. The World Health Organization, an alcohol drinking body, has been invited in by the Christian majority to help stamp out the evil leaf cot, which is supposed to make people uh, mentally deficient, uh, cause all sorts of health problems, psychological problems. Uh, as I think you've illustrated, one of your major points is 
that knowledge is incredibly important here. There's a lot of misinformation, and we've got to get the facts straight. In chocolate and morphine, you attempt to do that for young people. Right. Um, how do you deal with the charge that by telling young people so much about each drug, including advice on how not to get in trouble with a given drug, that you are positively encouraging the young people of America and the world to use drugs? You see, my feeling is that by not telling kids the truth, you get yourself into worse trouble. Most drug education in this country is not, in my view, real drug education. It's thinly disguised efforts to scare kids away from the drugs we don't like by exaggerating their dangers while not being honest about the drugs that we do like and not mentioning uh, the fact that they are drugs and strong drugs that people can get into trouble with. When you are dishonest about the dangers of drugs, when you exaggerate the dangers of the drugs we don't like, I think that that makes kids intensely curious about them. Now, here's one reason I think that. In my travels in South America, I said I spent much time with Indian groups. I'll give you one example. I lived with a tribe of Indians called Cubeos, who are in the Amazon basin in Colombia near the border of Brazil. They use coca leaf as a daily stimulant. They grow coca, they powder it, toast it, powder it, elaborate preparation. And each hut in this village has a tube or can of this prepared coca powder. And the adult men mostly scoop spoonfuls of it into their mouth and suck on it. Uh, it combines the functions of chewing gum and coffee in our culture. It has low doses of cocaine in it. Uh, it's much safer than isolated cocaine. Uh, cocaine you buy on the street here may be 60 percent cocaine. There's a huge difference in concentration. Coca In coca you suck on this powdered leaf and the cocaine slowly enters the bloodstream through the mouth. That's very different from putting cocaine in your nose or smoking it and putting it in your lungs or injecting it into a vein when you get very rapid rises in concentrations of cocaine in the blood and the brain and that can cause an addictive pattern of use. In addition, in coca leaf, uh, the drug is combined with 14 other drugs that modify the effect of cocaine, probably in a safer direction. Uh, coca has health benefits which have been well documented by doctors which isolated cocaine does not have. So there's really a day and night difference between coca leaf and cocaine that's pulled out of the leaf and made available in pure chemical form. In this Cubeo society, there was a tradition that the drug was not used by children. Uh, it was something used by adult men. Now, there were a lot of children in this tribe. And I would go around and ask all the children, I talked to them in Spanish, which they could understand, don't you want to know what it's like to chew coca? And they would say, no. I would say, don't you want to know what it feels like? <laughs> no. Don't you want to know how it makes your dad feel when he chews coca? No, I'll wait till I grow up. I've never heard children in our society say anything like that. How do you explain that? I think there is simply no curiosity on the part of children because this is not a forbidden thing. That is, there are no laws regulating its use. There are no prohibitions. Rather, there is a, a cultural tradition, which everyone accepts, that the use of coca is a sign of reaching maturity. When a man marries and has his own household, he begins preparing and using coca. It's just something that's not done, and it doesn't occur to children to do it. And I feel very strongly that it's the absence of the prohibitionist mentality that favors that social process. I think if you went in there and told kids they couldn't have it, and said they couldn't have it because it stunts your growth, then you'd find kids wanting to try it. And I think essentially the messages that we put out in our standard drug education do just that. You know, I've been in this field for over 30 years, and in that time I've watched the age of experimentation with drugs drop steadily. When I was first doing my marijuana studies back in 1968 as a medical student, the idea that a grade school kid would try marijuana, let alone cocaine or LSD, was absolutely unthinkable. In other words, during an era of, of, of increasing drug war and an increasing prohibitionist mentality, things have gotten a lot worse. A lot worse. And not, not only that, I think you can look back over the entire hundred years of drug prohibition and see everything steadily getting worse. In fact, I think it's interesting to look at how America of 1891 was different from America of 1991 with respect to drugs. In, in 1891, we had no drug laws and no drug prohibitions. But the main problems of 1891 were two. First, that there were the medical profession thoughtlessly prescribed 
dangerous addictive substances without realizing their dangers and hooked a lot of people on them. And that was true of, uh, with cocaine, with morphine, and so forth. Now, that pattern has not changed very much, I'm sorry to say. The medical profession still dispenses addictive drugs without realizing their dangers, although the, which drugs are in use has changed. The second problem was that a great many over-the-counter remedies were available which contained addictive substances, like including morphine and cocaine and heroin, without notice to the user of the contents or the dangers of the drugs. Now, that problem has been ended by the food and drug regulations that we have. But in a, those seem to me to be the main drug problems of 1891. There was no crime associated with the distribution of drugs. Children and adolescents were not taking drugs. People were not taking drugs to drop out of society or to express anger against authorities and parents. Uh, people were mostly using drugs in legally manufactured form in standardized dosages. They were mostly taking them by mouth. They weren't shooting impure substances into their veins with dirty needles or smoking concentrated forms of drugs. All of the violence in the cities that's now associated with drug trafficking, trafficking was not there. I think if you look at the history of the drug laws and drug prohibitions, you see a steady correlation with everything getting worse. That is, more and more people using more and more drugs in worse and worse ways, with younger and younger children using drugs, in step with the increasing prohibition and drug laws. But let me ask this. In The Natural Mind, and perhaps in some of your other books, you said that you, you were not necessarily an advocate of changing the drug laws. You talked against political action. Okay. Haven't you changed over the years sure. on that? Now, you, actually, let me, let me correct you, though, on one point. I said that about political action specifically with respect to legalizing marijuana. And this okay. was because uh, at the time I wrote that, the Schaefer Commission was in existence. This was under the Nixon White House in the early 70s, and it was a commission specifically to look at marijuana and marijuana laws. And I was called before that, I felt, as a token spokesman for the the radical viewpoint. And the commission expected me to say that I was in favor of legalizing marijuana. I wanted to get their attention. And so what I said was that I was not in favor of legalizing marijuana as an isolated step. Because what was wrong was not the marijuana laws, it was the whole mentality of drug prohibition behind that law. And until that changed, it seemed to me that the single step of legalizing marijuana would do nothing to correct the general problems that we were in with drugs. I am a very strong advocate today of doing away with criminal sanctions for drug use and drug prohibitions. I am also a very strong proponent of learning to alter consciousness in non-harmful ways. That is to satisfy that need for varied experience in ways that don't get you into trouble, physical, social, psychological. Uh, and therefore, I am not by any means an advocate of using consciousness-altering substances. I am an advocate of consciousness alteration in safe ways. And I think that the main duty of society is to teach people how to satisfy that need in ways that are non-harmful. I feel that the current drug laws encourage people to use substances in ways that are harmful. OK, and if we continue in the present path, uh, uh, what do you see, especially what new drugs do you see on the horizon? I think we will see a continuation of everything getting worse that I've pointed out has gone on in this century. That is that I think there will be more and more people, younger and younger ages, involved in the use of stronger and stronger and more dangerous drugs. It seems very clear that you cannot make drugs go away. And that in fact, if you limit people's access to the more common drugs, that the drugs that appear to take their place are likely to be more dangerous. For example, we have already seen in this country that when any success has been made at limiting the flow of opium products into the country, that there has appeared the possibility of chemists synthesizing, without reliance on poppies, opiates that are very potent, much more dangerous to use, associated with a great deal of medical harm. In the same way, I think, uh, from talking with chemists involved in this field, any door that you manage to close through the effects of law, prohibitions, and so forth, another one opens, and what's behind it is likely to be worse. Let me take you back to, to uh, a drug that was very popular a long time ago, and I think still may be, marijuana. Right. You wrote uh, a lot about that. You, you uh, ran one of the first experiments with human subjects while still a, a medical student under your mentor, Norman Zinberg. 
what what do you have to say about marijuana to uh, the people of the nation and the world? I mean, uh, uh, is it uh, uh, something they should be terribly concerned about? No, I certainly don't think so. And in fact, uh, one, of the, one of the saddest results of the war on drugs is that there, it has been quite effective in curtailing supplies of marijuana so that many people who like to smoke marijuana now can't get marijuana. And I think that people who like to smoke marijuana when they can't get marijuana will turn to stronger drugs and drugs that otherwise they wouldn't use. I think it is, not, it is in society's interest to let those who want to smoke marijuana use it because, in fact, it's not such a terrible drug. You know, my feeling is that it is uh, much, much less toxic than alcohol. And alcohol is a very strong, very dangerous, very toxic drug. Uh, used in excess, alcohol regularly destroys parts of the nervous system and the liver. And what's interesting here is that these effects are irreversible. Now, with most drugs, and this includes cocaine, heroin, uh, LSD, most of the drugs that people are afraid of, the damage, uh, the physical damage, if any, that are ca that's caused is reversible. You get a person off the drug and all the physical changes go back to normal. But with alcohol, if that is used in excess over time, the physical changes that happen cannot be reversed. The damage to the nervous system cannot be reversed. The damage to the liver cannot be reversed. Now, this is a very dangerous substance in physical terms. Marijuana is at the complete other end of the spectrum. No one has even been able to calculate what a lethal dose of marijuana would be. Uh, I think the, the risks of marijuana are that in physical terms is that it's an irritant to the respiratory system and some people are more susceptible to that than others. Over time, I think you, it, is, it is likely that marijuana use could increase the risk of lung cancer. Uh, however, most marijuana smokers do not consume nearly as much marijuana as most tobacco smokers. And tobacco is a highly addictive drug containing a very powerful stimulant, nicotine, that creates a basis for a physical addiction. Marijuana does not have anything like that in it. The THC is not a, a strong drug in that sense. I certainly see people who get dependent on marijuana. It's a, it's a peculiar addiction, different from some of the others, in that if the marijuana isn't there, people don't think about it. But if it is there, they can't limit their, their use of it. And, uh, but I think, you know, in, in, the, in uh, psychological terms, um, I have certainly seen some people have uh, memory impairment or difficulty in concentration from using a lot of marijuana, but these are very heavy users. Uh, most people I knew, know who are or have, and have observed who are moderate uh, social users of marijuana have really never gotten into any kind of trouble with that. And uh, I, I think that's a, that is a benign uh, use of a drug in people who are otherwise normal and responsible in society. I don't see that it's in society's interest to devote so much energy and money to trying to make that drug go away and to trying to punish users for its use. You, you implied something that I've heard you say. I wonder if you still believe it. You implied, really, uh, uh, that the legal drugs as a group are probably a greater threat than the illegal drugs as a group. Uh, the legal drugs as a group are much more to be worried about than most of the Ill illicit ones. Alcohol, as I have said, is the strongest drug known in terms of its effects to change physiology and behavior. There is no other drug which so regularly is associated with crime and violence, and this has to do with the direct pharmacological effects of alcohol. The addiction to alcohol is very serious. You can die of alcohol addiction. You do not die of heroin addiction. Uh, alcohol causes irreversible physical changes. Opiates do not do that. Cocaine does not do that. So alcohol is the most dangerous. Uh, tobacco in the form of cigarettes is the most addictive drug known. You know, maybe crack probably is in the same ballpark with it. And for the same reasons, that this is a strong stimulant taken into the lungs and brain directly. I was going to ask you about crack. Uh, uh, in fact, some of my students asked me to ask you about All right. crack. Uh, uh, you stick to your guns on this separation, you know, the legal drugs as a group worse. Even with the advent of crack and even with the increasing use of PCP, or with the use of PCP. Right. Yes, I do. I think, as I said, I think crack is right up there with tobacco, that it's the same kind of addiction. Um, 
although in terms of numbers of people involved and medical consequences, tobacco is much the worse. And if you look at caffeine, I mean, take coffee, which is the strongest of the caffeine drugs. Uh, most users of coffee in our society are addicted to it. I, I would say about 80% of coffee users are addicted. Now, what most people don't realize is that coffee is a strong drug. It's in the, it's in the same league as other stimulants. Uh, it's okay to use it occasionally and consciously if you know what you're doing, but most people who use it and are addicted to it have no idea that coffee is a drug, let alone one that can affect their body and mind. As a physician, uh, I see many people who have coffee-related problems, things like insomnia, anxiety, bladder infections, um, nervous problems, heart problems, arrhythmias, so forth. And what interests me is that doctors don't tell people that this is coffee-related. That's because they don't learn this in medical school and they drink coffee themselves. I produce about one miracle cure every two to three weeks by just getting somebody to stop drinking coffee. Let me ask you about uh, physicians taking drugs, all right? You said, I think in chocolate to morphine, that you had experimented with many of the drugs uh, that you write about in the book. How do you deal with that? Isn't that a bad example? I don't think it's a bad example at all. First of all, I, I, I would not consider myself a drug expert if I hadn't tried things myself, because one of the main sources of information is your own experience. That was a, a really a great tradition in Western medicine until very recently of self-experimentation by people who carefully recorded their experiences and were good observers. That should not be the only kind of information, but it's an essential component of information. Furthermore, I think it's unethical to give drugs in research situations to other people until you first exposed yourself to them. Uh, in my medical practice as well, I, tend, I try not to prescribe things to patients that I haven't at least tried myself to assure myself that they are safe and what the possible side effects are. Uh, I think that there would be a great deal less prescribing of drugs in this society by doctors if doctors were required to try at least one dose of every substance that they handed out before they gave them to other people. This has been a fascinating exploration along the frontiers of the mind and of drugs and consciousness. I want to thank Dr. Andrew Weil and I want to thank all of you for listening. I'm sure that among you, uh, there's a real division of opinion about the worth of the ideas of Andrew Weil. However you feel, we at the Drug Policy Foundation would love to hear from you. You can call us on the 800 number on your screen, or you can write us at the address that will appear there also. Until the next edition of America's Drug Forum, this is Arnold Treback saying so long for now.